I'm not too sure if some of you guys know, but in in London, a new very popping bar has popped up, and you would never guess which one it is. It's a lesbian bar. A lesbian bar in London has become all the rage. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's yapping about it. Everybody's going there. Blah de blah blah blah. And I have to be honest, I'm actually surprised it's taken this long for something like this to even launch because I feel like there's always been a demand. There's always been a demand within my little scene of hipsters and scenesters and heads and industry people, techno, whatever. I feel like there's always a gap in the market for a safe space for the lesbians to hang out anyway. I never understood why that wasn't something that somebody started before because there are loads of gay bars, there's loads of gay clubs, but most of those you would imagine are usually kind of like, you know, populated and dominated by gay guys, right? And nowadays, there's probably a need for like queer spaces for people who present themselves as female presenting, you know, whatever, right? And you'd imagine a lesbian, a lesbian bar would be the perfect place for people who probably occupy or fall under the Flinter banner, the Flinter label. That's probably be the safe space for them because they could probably go there and have no commun- have no communication whatsoever with someone that looks like me, which is probably what they would want. So I'm surprised why that hasn't been something that they haven't done before. But I'm glad to see that it's popping off and doing really well. So this is courtesy of the face. It says lesbian bar, the people made happen. Um, the name of it is called La Comoniera. La Comoniera is the only flinter female lesbian, intersex, non binary, trans, and agender owned lesbian bar in London. Now it's putting down its permanent roots. Alec Lovelace and their partner, Clara Solis, had no idea that opening the lesbian pop up bar, La Comoniera, would become a viral TikTok moment. Hundreds of sapics spilling um, out into the venue, um, commingling with their exes and exes exes down the East London Broadway market. But clutching cold pints outside the middle of February, it was clear that something was happening. The whole street is full of lesbians, a friend excitedly told the couple. Nearly half of Gen Z's Brits identify as something other than straight. What? Really? Nearly half of Gen Z's? Jesus Christos. And yet La Comanera is the only Flinter um, owned bar in London. Um, it represents a milestone for the London's lesbians, but given queer nights well, but given queer nightlife thriving communities across the country, not to mention the fact that it's two hundred and four, why does it still feel like a novelty? That's what I'm saying. Because we've got a great there's a pretty good one as well. What's it called? Dawson Superstore. That's pretty awesome. But I'd imagine Dawson Superstore is also probably a little bit more gay friendly as opposed to flintering queer friendly you would assume so but i could be wrong um i met loveless and solace in what feels more like a building site than a bar following that first viral pop-up evening in february the pair threw themselves into the search of the permanent space for la comunera um launching a crowdfunding campaign that brought in around thirty thousand in the first 24 hours if that's not proof that you've got an idea i don't know what is they raised thirty thousand pounds in the first twenty-four hours. That's proof that people were gagging for this bar, innit? It was crazy, says Solace. There's nothing like it in London, so people wanted it to make it happen. Recruiting an army of lesbian builders, design what? Really? They had they had an old lesbian um workforce building the whole place out. That's fucking crazy. I love that. Recruiting an army of lesbian builders, designers, plumbers and gardeners. The pair set to work on a new hackney venue inspired at a local joints um, in La Manca, southern Spain, where Solis family is from. When it's done, it will be really nice, says Loveless, as the team of builders behind us. Oh, by the way, I think La Comanera, doesn't it mean like a, isn't it like a, isn't it like a, another word for like a female truck driver or something, you know, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's where the name comes from. Um, Sound too windy. Oh, sorry, so, sat, sat on two windy wooden uh, chairs by a wall of white tiles, which Solis says is hand-painted by an erotic blue balls. I asked the pair about the recent Instagram post addressing the flurry of comments asking whether the bar would be open to other demographics in the LGBT community. Yo, big up Don Dutta. Okay, cool. Thank you, Don Dutta. I appreciate, appreciate you. I have to be honest, right? I hate this type of question. I think it's... I think... I'm, I'm a weirdo. I'm a weirdo. I believe that you can create utopias in clubs. I believe that you can create these like semi-permanent spaces where people can unplug from the horrors of everyday life and wh- while they get transported into your club, into your bar. You can do that. They don't last forever. You can't fucking 
drown your problems away because they'll be there tomorrow. You can't sniff them away. You can't peel them away. You can't fuck them away. But in that very small time that you have available to you, you can enjoy yourself and you can kind of forget all your troubles on the outside. So I don't have a problem with nightlife, with there being in hospitality and nightlife in general, with there being spaces that are made specifically for a certain community of people. I think that's perfectly fine. But it's unfortunately, we live in a capitalist world and sometimes if you limit the people who can come into your space, especially in places like London, it can kind of affect the amount of money you can make and the amount of money you make will affect your ability to stay open. So if you can find a way to stay open and still only service your little community, I'm all for it. I don't feel discriminated against. I don't feel left out. I don't feel like rejected. I don't feel anything. I am happy that you're servicing your community and providing your community with a quote-unquote safe space. That's perfect because they, they don't really exist anywhere else. If someone can create a little hub where you guys can chill and hang out, have a good time and feel safe around each other, go for it. I'm all for it. I'm going to be rooting for you from across the street. Great. Do your thing. But unfortunately, in the capitalist world, it's really hard to make that happen long term. But I feel like when people start blurring the lines, oh, it's lesbian. It's a lesbian bar. But does that mean if I identify as a woman that I could come in? It's like, come on, bro. Let them have their space. You know what I mean? There's plenty of other non-lesbian bars you can go to and have a good time. They've got one. Again, think about how multicultural, how d diverse London is that there's only one lesbian bar. It's pretty insane if you think about it. It doesn't make any sense. Especially if you go out at night, you'll know that most popping nights in london especially in the part of london that i live in they're dominated by especially on the dance floor the only people you see there are fucking gays and lesbians anyway so imagine they're everywhere they dominate the dance floor they're the ones that create all the great parties they put out they have some of the best you know creatives in the scene they're doing all the cool interesting things but they only have one bar they can go to after work and you know put their feet on the table crack a smile have a bit of a chin wag and hang out with their fellow quote-unquote sisters come on man come on it continues i don't often feel super welcome so it says here i don't often feel super welcome at queer nights wow you know how weird that is i don't often feel super welcome at queer nights unless i really change myself loveless who is trans i would go into these spaces where they're like oh yeah oh shit so this person isn't a that's actually a trans person my bad i thought this person here was okay cool that makes some sense now I get it. Now I understand what's going on. Let's go back to the article. I don't often feel super welcome at queer nights unless I really change myself, said Loveless, who is trans. I would go into these spaces where they're like, oh yeah, trans people are so welcome. But they'd look at me <laughs> and then go, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> oh, that's so wild. It's like me. I just, I just, what you call it? I just misgendered this person. I just, from the, from the, you know, from the... From what you can see, it looks like a guy, but it's not. You're like, oh, okay. The bar's opening comes amid a wave of trans exclu ex exclusionary legislations in the UK from banning inclusive language in NHS documents to cracking down on gender neutral toilets. Even within the LGBT LGBTQ plus community, trans people are othered. The UK's first lesbian members club, the L community, is set to open up in Southwark later this year and it's excluding trans women from joining. Fucking hell. What a weird... Like, it happens all the time anyway. It's, it's like black people, right? The most racist people within the black community are black people, right? Like, the racism amongst, like, Africans, the racism amongst Caribbeans, the racism amongst fucking Africans, the Caribbeans is fucking crazy. So, um, I'm not surprised it's not the I'm not surprised it's, it's the same thing in the fucking lgbtq plus, plus community everyone's kind of snapping at each other um why do we have to um capitulate the to these definitions that no one can agree on if you want to come to like a monera come here i want to set a precedent that you shouldn't have to explicitly specify what identity as what you identify as oh ho, 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 ho. if you want to come to like monera come here I want to set a precedent that you should have to explicitly specify what you identify as. Well, I still don't think I should go, you know? Let them have their thing. Let them enjoy their thing. It looks fun. Happy they have it, but let them enjoy their thing. Um, it doesn't take us to a point um, out that, co that queer nights in the UK are facing significant challenges. Queer venues have been disproportionately affected by the scary, sorry, rent, sorry, 
living cost within the with six what with six in ten LGBTQ venues closing in 2006 2022 according to Pink News. But it wasn't always this way, as in the early 1940s, London lesbians would congregate in the dark cellar of the Gateways the pubs in King's Cross, um, Chelsea. Decades later, it was pretty much the only safe space to pick someone up, says Lisa Power, co-founder of the charity's organisation Stonewall. Making passes at women, unless you were absolutely dead certain they were another lesbian or at least bi, was really risky thing to do. Um, secret establishments became the longest serving no, the secret establishment became the longest serving lesbian club in the world, frequented by the likes of BBC radio presenter DJ Ritu, artist Maggie Hambling, and Patricia Highsmith, who wrote the pioneer lesbian novel Carol in 1952. For some, however, the gateway hasn't bragged the quite enough. The nightclub banned the gay liberation front from meeting there and profited the political fillers. Or, sorry, um, prohibited political flyers from the premises. Power once got chased out of the club for putting up a poster with the word lesbian on it. Jesus Christos. Lesbian party spread across North London during the decade too. Stoke Newton became known as a lesbian mecca. Birthing bars such as Blush, Oak Bar, in Dawson, can, um, clandestine burlesque clubs emerged in derelict Chinese restaurants serving one pound vegan food. Then there was a glass bar, a hidden enclave filled with velvet drapes and fairy lights that just outside of Houston. So, it seems like, for some reason, I'm not sure what the reason is, but it seems like from what they're trying to describe here, lesbian nightlife or lesbian safe spaces have always been a little bit more undercover, underground, than gay bars, which is odd, isn't it? You'd think it'd be the other way around, but actually the lesbian bars were the ones that they had to really take care to kind of keep under wraps and not let people kind of find out that they were there and shit. Um, for Nancy Keeley, director of the Lesbian Visibility Week and executive director of Lesbian Magazine, um, diva the bar was a sanctuary for the violent homophobia she experienced on the streets it had this really magical feel to it it's like entering a doorway into a different world exactly and i think for once it should be they should try to ex maybe because i'd imagine now that they're super popular they probably do exclude but i think they should try to exclude i think they should try and keep it hey lesbians only I know some of you dudes are allies. I know some of you dudes are cool. You might have lesbian fucking friends, sisters, mothers. But let's just keep it lesbian only. So that the people that are coming there after work, if you actually want to go to a quote-unquote safe space and put your feet up and just, you know, sit in a different environment that isn't fucking, you know, that isn't, you know, um, scented or has doesn't have the stench <laughs> of men, then you could go in this bar. I think that's pretty cool, but... Whether or not you can do that in London, I'm not too sure, you know? I'm not too sure if you can do that in London. I'm not sure if that's possible in London. I'm not too sure if it's possible in London. I think people here get really fucking annoyed at not being involved, and they make it into, like, a personal thing. Like, oh, you, you're telling me that I can't get in a row? It's like, bro, please, let's have one space, please, if you don't mind. Um, it continues here. In 1985, the same year as the Gateway, the Gateway Club closed, its doors, DJ Yvonne Taylor and Eddie Lockhart set up systematic a black lesbian run sound system that ran monthly in parties in south london women's center in brixton yo if, if it's hard being white and lesbian can you imagine how hard it is to be black and lesbian within the african and caribbean community Ooh -hoo! Ooh -hoo! could you imagine how hard it is to grow up in a household where you have your parents like you know saying some dicey dicey things about people within a community can you imagine coming out to your parents when you're like when you're when your mum and dad are from yard yard yo um towards the turn of the century however venues become disappearing systematic closed in 1995 and the women's center lost its funding the glass bar closed in 2008 and candy bar closed in 2014 lesbian didn't and don't have the economic power that gay men and straight people have says power it's really that that's really the problem in tracing the history of lesbian clubs, apart from the gateway, most of them didn't last that long. And to be fair, even in Berlin, when I went to Berlin, I don't I, again, I wasn't looking for them, but I was always wondering that as well. I was in there because I think that was around the time people were debating around like snacks. I think it's snacks. There's like a night in Berkheim that's like just for gay guys, and you're like, and you're meant to just go there naked and shit. You just have to turn up in trainers, right? And I remember a lot of people basically said, No, I think, no, sorry, that that's one night, but they've also got a night in Berkheim that's like specifically for the Flinter people. But I remember there was a debate and argument because a lot of the guys that would go to snack were also going to Flinter nights. And it was like, hold on, you have your own night where you get to like fuck each other silly in the entire fucking building, right, for snacks. 
and we have this one flint tonight and you're also coming to that. It's like, come on, man, give it a break. Do you know what I mean? Let us have our own spaces. But then it made me wonder, like, why don't they have just like lesbian club nights? Like, why doesn't that exist in Bergheim? I'm sure they could. it could be viable. They could easily have like one Friday a month where they just have a lesbian night and then it's just, you know, only quote unquote lesbians are allowed in. That might actually be pretty cool because there's clearly a demand for it because, you know, these guys raise $30,000 or 30,000 pounds, sorry, in only a few hours. That's fucking wild. Um, on the one hand, the lack of permanent LGBTQ plus venues has given rise to an eclectic DIY scene pioneered by communities who felt othered in white and cis male dominated areas. I think the label of queer became a catch all, which means that some specific, some specific spec specificities get lost and needs of specific communities get lost, says um, Rabs Lacquiz Coit. What's her, what's her name? Lancy Coit. Lancy Coit, co-founder of South London BPOC um, Prioritised Party Wet. These communities have felt like they need to create their own spaces. Agree. The options are deezing. Sex worker led sex and rage throws lesbian strip club parties in Dawson. Mirenge celebrates fat queer culture with kaleidoscopic chaotic parties. Last year, Systematic teamed up with Nitsy Dykes or Night Dykes. Sorry, that's a pretty cool way to, to spell Night Dykes. I quite like that. Night Dykes to revive the iconic um, Santas and parties and bring a generation of black lesbians together for musical journey, spanning Lovers Rock and Dub and Ballroom. Man, I thought, I thought really weird one time when I was sitting down thinking of ideas for parties. I was like, oh, I should do a party called like Niggas in Techno, right? Like a play on Niggas in Paris. And I was thinking of like t-shirt designs and flyer designs and shit. And I was like, oh, I did. and I thought, oh no, that'd be a bit lame, right? Having like a, what, like a, like a techno party that's only for black people or something. But now that I hear this, I'm like, Br maybe I was onto something. Maybe I was a freedom fighter. Maybe I should do that. <laughs> hey, yo, big up, big up, big up, big up, big up fashion road, man. What's good? What's good, brother? What's good? Um... What's Chris Mack saying? The lesbians have been getting it rough lately, to be honest. Remember Reddit was banning their communities for transphobia because they didn't like women pants with penises. What? The lesbians have been getting a rough time lately. Remember Reddit banning their communities because of transphobia because they didn't like women with penises. Oh, that's fucking... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think they should be... I'm sure they're not going to be allowed to do it because London's weird with, like, excluding people and, you know... There's probably rules around it and it might get shut down. But they should be allowed to just be like, hey, if you have a dick, you can't come in. They should be allowed to do that. I think they should be allowed. There should be at least one safe space where all these people can go and have a good time and chill and relax without fucking being, you know, within the, within the fucking, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Still, without permanent venues, <coughs> running queer nights can be challenging. We're always in basements, says Becca Homer who runs East London Dyke Party Strapped and 537 events. Venues never give us weekend nights because they think the lesbians only love to co to crochet. But to be fair, you also have to prove that you can sell tickets. I don't think it's fair to like complain that clubs are not giving you weekend nights because weekend nights are only given to promoters who can guarantee they can sell tickets. So if you can guarantee you have a demand, and that you're going to bring a ton of lesbians out and they're going to fucking buy up all the tickets. They're going to be buying drinks, cloakroom full. They're going to give you fucking a weekend night. They don't give a fuck who books it. Satanists, lesbians, you know, Tories. They don't give a fuck. You know what I mean? Not to say you guys are the same, but you know what I mean. Uh, not having a permanent venue also means being in the mercy of the building owners and staff who aren't necessarily queer themselves. For many organizers, this means having to go over to LGBTQ plus disabled inclusion protocols before every event. Um, we've had so many part problems with security over the years, said Nadine Noor, founder of QTB Pot Club Night Pussy Palace. Um, one of our main producers is trans woman and they've been transphobic to her before. I think this is a little bit, again, I think this is a good thing because I think for the longest time, a lot of London club nights were quite lazy. A lot of London club nights were just about going into a space, having a DJ performing on a black table and that's it. I think having to have a lot of these communities maybe go above and beyond and hire their own security or hire security that is trained how to deal with people from the you know lgbtq flinter scene i think that's a good thing because what it means is that you are putting a lot more care and attention to what you do you're being a little bit more um you know you're having a, you're, you're going above and beyond to make sure that people's experience and raving 
and what you're doing is really good, which is what the clubs in Europe do. They are, they already have it already instilled, but they do it anyway. Do you know what I mean? And that's why the experience when you go places like Amsterdam and Berlin is so much better than London because of those little details, right? From the person at the door, from the person taking your ticket, person doing the cloakroom, everyone's been considered. Everyone knows Wagwan. Everyone's very comfortable with the people they're going to be seeing and shit. They're going to be dealing with them a certain way. I think that's the way to go about things. So this is obviously more of a necessity sort of thing. Um, and I think it's going to be, it's going to serve everyone right in the long run. Some have responded to the venue challenges in different ways. Yuhu Dyke Rescue has built an old school American inspired portable van that will rock up at parties and festivals serving pints and hosting arm wrestling matches. But as Nor says, we are queer people who have constantly lived in we are queer people have constantly lived in temporary. We need permanent spaces too, because we have something permanent, then you're able to grow the roots. Yeah, I agree with that. That's true. That's very, very true. Um, on a balmy evening, La Camonera finally opened its permanent doors. Um, the building was still rough around the edges. Sure, the toilet didn't have them handles. Um, they've since been fitted and the food menu had yet to begin. But the tiny vases of pink and purple and blue flowers, takeaway pizza and portable speaker playing sweet, sweet sugary tunes. London's second lesbian bar was already a success. The team is now waiting to court, um, now waiting for a court hearing, which will determine their license. Right now, they're only allowed 36 people in the venue. Really? Also, it's not really a bar. It's like a, you know, they've opened like a space. But to get a, like an actual bar license, they need to apply. But Loveless is looking for the future. I just hope that people continue to show up. The whole idea behind the project was to make a permanent space. I really want that to have longevity. So yeah, more power to La Comanera. Honestly, really amazing venue to see this exist in London. It's very fucking rare. I'm glad to see they're around. Hopefully they can stick around. Hopefully they can get that late license. Hopefully they can continue servicing their community, putting on great nights, entertaining people, providing them with a fucking safe space and all that malarkey. And it just exists as need be. They don't need to do anything else crazy. And it just can just exist. Even if it exists and it doesn't hang around for long, the fact that they have this space and they can kind of create their little stories and shit and play a role in people's lives for however long they're around would be a good thing. So I'm glad to see it. Glad to see it exist and may it long continue. May it long continue. Be up, Chris Mack. It's wild, man. Like, why would you want to intrude into a space where you're clearly not watched? Exactly, 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 exactly. Um, but yeah, more power to La Comanera. More power to La Comanera. La Camionera, London's new lesbian bar, has officially opened its doors over the weekend in Hackney. We caught up with some of the attendees. It almost feels like the next phase of like the lesbian renaissance in London that people are calling it. <laughs> people actually investing to um, opening safe spaces for LGBT Q uh, plus people. It's really nice to see a space that um, it's open mostly for Flinter people. I feel like we've been lacking this sort of space. The space uh, feels safe. Bought quite a few of my friends here recently and also really look forward to summer being here. I think having La Camionera open, it means a lot to have a permanent kind of like queer women and um, non-binary space. I think um, often we have to, you know, there's like one night of the week that's like the lesbian or the queer women night. And that tends to be like a week night and it's really far away. So to have like a permanent venue where you can come with your friends that like isn't a club as well is like very exciting. You currently have to RSVP in advance to get a spot with limited walk-ins available. The gayest thing about the Caminera is the fact that some bloke runs it. Or the gayest thing about the Caminera is all the straight men that come in for coffee in the morning and then there's a lesbian bar. The gayest thing about the Caminera is that all the bike racks are taken up.